Hey everybody, here we are again doing the live stream. Uh, tonight you've got uh, triple trouble. You've got myself as head of flight operations, Jared as head of airworthiness and maintenance, and Darren as our assistant head of airworthiness and maintenance. Um, we've got a couple of different topics to talk about tonight. Um, the main thing we want to focus on is our return to proficiency for pilots and aircraft in regards to COVID-19 restrictions that we've all been uh, dealing with over the last few months. Um, so we'll start off uh, by talking about uh, pilots returning to proficiency, but part of that is obviously going to include use of aircraft, which is where we're going to need Jared involved as well. So we've developed a few tools to help pilots work out if they're going to be um, safe to just jump in their plane and go flying um, versus perhaps using an instructor or um, uh, or other uh, means to get their proficiency up. So let's first off, um, we've got Cody and Moret working in the background for us. So let's see how quick they are at getting the RAL's pilot currency barometer up, which is a document that, oh, that's pretty quick. Nice work. Okay. So what we've done is we've developed this uh, process here to allow pilots to have a look at their number of hours in the past six months and the number of landings in the past three months to assist them to work out whether they're rusty, as it says on the right, or whether you should just exercise caution um, or whether your status is good. So we thought we might uh, just talk through a little bit about what this barometer is all about. So the first box on the top right, top left, using the barometer, talks about asking you to just do a, a quick add up on your um, last six months of flying and your last three months of landings and then locate those figures. So let's use me as an example. Um, I've done, in the last six months, I've probably done 15 hours. So I'm at the top of the green on the left. You can see Cody's doing a little wiggle of the mouse there. So 15 plus hours. And of that, I generally try to do three or four circuits in each hour that I fly if I'm flying locally. So I'll have 25 plus hours uh, landings. So I go a line between 15 and 25. I'm in the top of the green. I'm relatively proficient. I'm relatively recent. I have to make sure I'm not going to be um, complacent. Um, and I'm still going to make sure that I use in the box on the top right there, I'm going to make sure I use thorough pre-flights, use checklists. I configure the aircraft properly. I fly it accurately. I practice my emergency actions, I do standard circuits and I use standard radio phrases. So uh, let's look at another scenario. Let's say uh, in the last six months you haven't been able to fly because you haven't been able to get near your aircraft because of COVID restrictions. And prior to that, you might have had bushfires or you might have had um, any other reasons, uh, family emergencies or lack of aircraft. So let's use a scenario of someone that's got say seven hours of flying. So you can see Cody's gonna do a little wiggle there around the seven on the left-hand side. And in that time, because you only flew um, local flights and didn't do any circuits, you might only have uh, three landings in the last three months as a result. We draw a line between the two, that puts you in the yellow area. And in the yellow area, we say you have to exit, well, we recommend you exercise caution, and stay within your limits because you might not be as good as you think. So uh, that's a bit of a reference to our potential invulnerability uh, and complacency that we all have as pilots. And we suggest in that instance to consider a flight check with an instructor. So that's not a flight review, that's just say, hey instructor at my local airfield, do you wanna just come for a lap around the block with me and make sure I'm doing things as I should because I might've forgotten how to use checklists or might have forgotten how to do an emergency properly. I might have forgotten some radio calls. Um, and there may actually be some extra risks if you're operating at a new airfield, if you're using a different type of aircraft to what you're used to, if you're doing flights after routine maintenance or unscheduled maintenance, or if you're flying at an airfield that's got high traffic, uh, which is the case at many of our airfields now, places like Mildura, Dubbo, uh, Kabulcha, Redcliffe, there are a number of high traffic aerodromes that are um, members operate at. And if we do a final scenario, um, in the last six months, because of bushfires, COVID, family emergencies, aircraft unavailability, there's been some real um, barriers to us going flying. Um, so if we were between zero and five hours in the last six months, and therefore, even if we've done, you know, 10 landings, then we are still potentially in a red zone 
and a red zone says, wow, you are pretty rusty and you should very much uh, be recommended to go and do a, a flight with an instructor to brush up on your skills. And you should also very much ensure that the local weather conditions are within your personal limits. So if you've suddenly decided to go flying, it's the only day that's available to you, but there's a 20 knot crosswind blowing, well, maybe you should consider delaying that flight or making sure you take an instructor with you. So uh, we've got to thank our colleagues at uh, the Gliding Federation and also the British Gliding Federation who actually originally created this document. Um, and this is not just something we want you to use for COVID. Obviously, um, at the moment, it's top of mind as to whether you're safe to fly or not. But any time that you've had a break from flying or any time that you've done minimal numbers of hours and landings, just grab this and have a look at it, see whether you're safe to fly and what steps you should take to, um, to make sure that you continue to be safe. But what I'll do now is I'm gonna hand over to Jared to talk about very briefly the sorts of things you should consider for your aircraft having sat for a little while. All right, thank you. Um, just before I get on to that, I just want to remind members that we at RAOs are offering a free special, special flight permit which is um, a couple of hundred dollar saving. So if your aircraft has been um, been packed away for a number of months and now the annual inspection is due uh, and you need to fly it away from the aerodrome it's located at um, to take it to your Laney L2, then a special flight permit is available for free uh, from RAOs. And you can access that application on our website under forms uh, it doesn't need to be printed. It is actually our first, other than the um, members joining page, our first digital form that is available. So I uh, encourage you to take that up if it's a requirement of yours. Some of the tips if, you're, if your machine has been sitting idle for some time, of course, would be to carry out a really thorough pre-flight inspection and don't rush it. Uh, possibly the first thing to check before anything else, and certainly before the aircraft is moved, is the fuel system for contamination. Um, water you know, can get into the fuel tank through poor cap seals or even the uh, cap locking mechanisms. And any substantial movement of the aircraft may disperse water and other contaminants away from the drain points. So attempt not to move it and drain the water as a first port of call. Uh, pedostatic systems are particularly prone to blockage either by water or insects, uh, which find the ports extremely attractive places to occupy, of course. And if you had blocked the ports off um, prior to storage, it'd be you know, really important to make sure that that is all removed prior to flight, along with any other um, remove um, before flight items. Another careful inspection should be carried out anywhere that birds may decide to nest. You know, don't forget to look inside tail fairings and um, look anywhere that um, rodents uh, you know, make it inside the airframe as well. It's um, just the worst enemy. It doesn't matter if the aircraft is parked indoors or outside. Um, those little buggers can break in anywhere. Now, supposedly, mice can get through a hole no bigger than the width of a pen. It's uh, quite impressive. Uh, tires will develop flat spots. Um, if they've not been turned for a while, so normally this isn't an issue, and once back in use, they will resume uh, their normal shape. But as aircraft tires have relatively small total volume compared with car tires, a small leakage can make a big difference on the pressure. And uh, this in turn will adversely affect the ground handling, and in particular the effect of drag, which is not going to be helpful uh, on your takeoff run. So something you want to check before you know, getting out onto the runway. Um, what else? Uh, you need to uh, the battery. Take the battery out and um, give it a good charge, and put it back in prior to flight. And then, lastly, uh, give the aircraft a good wash and clean, and inspect it uh, for defects and uh, any corrosion. Um, you know that may have been occurring over the time it's been in storage. Uh, so before I give it back to Chill. I'll just uh, cover what um, I'm going to cover with Darren later in this um, live stream. Is uh, a very common question over the last month uh, has been on condition engines. So Darren and I will discuss, you know, what on condition is and um, how it's applicable to amateur build aircraft, type certified aircraft, light sport aircraft for private operation and uh, for. Uh, use in schools. 
So stay tuned for that in a little bit. Over to you, Jill. Thanks, Joe. That's uh, that's good info. Um, there's a lot of stuff that pilots may not consider about their aircraft when they're going back. They're so excited about getting back in the air, and they just give it a quick little gloss over and jump in and go, um, and that can cause all sorts of rush. Yeah, don't rush it, exactly. It's still going to be there. The air's going to be there. The runway's going to be there. And Cody's just put up some information. Uh, don't forget we've got our uh, COVID-19 page on our website there, um, which has got a whole heap of information uh, about returning to flight for pilots and for aircraft. We all want to do it. I, uh, I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the extensions that were issued uh, as part of the COVID-19 assistance that we provided to our members. We worked with CASA to issue uh, automatic extensions uh, of certain periods for our pilots so we didn't have to rush or didn't have issues with not being um, compliant because of lapsed BFRs, so flight reviews for pilot certificate holders, or because of lapsed flight renewals for instructors and CFIs. So the main important uh, considerations include the fact that you didn't have to do anything as a member because we these extensions are automatically applied to your, to your due dates. However, logistically, we couldn't extend the, uh, the dates on, on our database. So your database will still show the date that your flight review was due, um, but you will have an automatic extension based on the date that your uh, flight review is due. So if your flight review was due from between the 1st of March and the 31st of July, you get an automatic 90 days to that date to complete a review. Um, and I'm pleased to say that many of our schools are returning back to normal flight operations with some COVID-19 uh, contamination protocols. Um, so a lot of our schools will be back and ready. In fact, they're probably hanging for you to come back and see them because they've had a, a bit of a break to their income. So go out and support our schools by getting back there and doing your flight review even if it's slightly early based on that extension. Um, if your flight review is due between the 31st of July and the 30th of September, you'll actually have a two month extension. So uh, again, that won't be showing in your um, member portal, but you can add that two months yourself. And if you have a flight review renewal due between the 30th of September and the 30th of November, you'll get a one month extension. So yep, there's the details there from Cody, there's a link. You can go and check that out. You can have a look at your member portal, work out when your flight review is due or your instructor renewal is due, and then work out when your extension is valid to. Beyond the extension date, there's no more additional extensions. So if you don't get a flight review or, or renewal done by that time, you're going to have to do a renewal before you can jump into a plane and go flying. So you will have to go see your instructor. Uh, we also uh, negotiated with CASA to have extensions for medical requirements, which for most of our members for driver licence self-declared is not relevant, provided you've given us a, a declaration at some stage like your membership renewal date, uh, you're fine. But our instructors that use our uh, equivalent to the CASA Class 2, our RAL's medical questionnaire and examination form, if that expired, uh, you've got an automatic six month extension on that, which makes life a whole lot easier because doctors, et cetera, are not um, uh, all that available at the moment. Cody's just put up a graphic that we developed, which is an attempt to assist you to work out where your extensions are valid from. So uh, you just pick the date that suits your extension due date, um, or your BFR due date, and it will then give you the a relevant extension. So uh, a graphic form of what I've just discussed. Thanks, Cody. That's actually really helpful. Um, after the 30th of December, the Ops Bulletin that we produced, which was Ops Bulletin 0120, uh, ceases. It cancels. So there are no more extensions after that date. If you haven't got anything done by then, um, you need to go do an, a renewal with your uh, with your CFI. Um, but don't forget, really, the, the best thing we can do to help our schools, which we need to have our schools available to, to help us with flight reviews, etc., uh, go and jump in a, a plane with an instructor. I'm sure uh, the instructors are itching to get back into the air as well. So jump in and, and do some flight reviews or do some proficiency flying. Go and brush up crosswinds or go and do a new endorsement and get some business back into those schools because uh, uh, they're the heart and soul of our organisation. Uh, have you got anything to add on that score, Jared? I see there was a question there from Peter Marsh. I think that you've answered that, Jill, and we'll just confirm. 
was uh, if you need to move your plane to have work done for your yearly inspection but are out of BFR, is this permissible under COVID-19 as in line with CASA? So you did cover that cool. question there, Peter. So hopefully, um, yeah, the question has been answered. Yep, awesome. Well, good. Uh, okay, well, so um, if there's no other specific questions there and we can come back to these questions at the end as well, what I'll do is uh, I'll hand over to um, uh, to Jared and Darren to talk about on condition, and I'll just sit in the background and uh, and listen in because it sounds like it's going to be an interesting discussion. All right, thanks, Joel. I got to uh, Darren joined us, so I'll start with um, just defining what is on condition. Okay. So on condition means an inspection or a functional check that determines an item's performance and may result in the removal of an item before it fails in service. So it is not a philosophy of fit until failure or fit and forget. So an engine will be on condition when its time before overhaul or TBO is exceeded in either by an hour stipulation or a time stipulation. So e.g. 2000 hours or 12 years time stipulation. So an engine can be five years old, but reach 2000 hours or have 300 hours and be 15 years old. In each of these cases, the engine would now be required to go on condition if applicable. So let's find out what aircraft types are applicable and why. So we'll start with amateur built. So that's an RL's registered aircraft that's fitted with a road tax engine is about to exceed its TBO. Can the aircraft to continue to operate with an unconditioned engine? And if so, why or why not? Okay, well, um, yes, an amateur built aircraft. So um, we need to, to um, start with identifying RAOS does not have a experimental amateur built category like our friends over at the SAAA. The only experimental category that we do have is LSA and I'll cover that shortly. But with an eminent built aircraft under RAOs, the rules and the guidelines in, 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 in the organisation's establishment allows a person uh, or a group of persons to uh, manufacture and fabricate uh, an aircraft for their own education and recreation, which is basically showing that they've built the major portion uh, of that aircraft. Now, that aircraft can be made out of chewing gum and string, uh, can be made out of spruce um, or aluminum, aluminium, um, or whatever else. So there is no, there are guidelines around the certification standards uh, that are needed for that aircraft, and we do the, the, the testing, but the components that are used in it um, uh, can be anything. So the motor could be out of a, uh, a VW uh, motor car. It'd be out of a BMW motorbike. Um, so for an engine that's on condition, so an engine that's re reached its serviceable life under its standard um, configuration is allowed to be utilised in the amateur built category to run past that um, requirement. Whilst the manufacturer might not support that, it is totally legal for our members to operate an engine past um, the TBO, the time before overhaul. But we also suggest that if a member is going to do that, that if you get to 2,000 hours and say you're able to pick up a, a, an engine that comes out of an aircraft uh, that is at TBO, um, that you, uh, you would then you know, do the mandatory, pop the gearbox off, get your sprag clutch checked um, and, and do the mandatory, you know, five yearly rubber replacements and, and effectively uh, establish yourself your own benchmark from that point. So it would be 2000, 2000, you know, 10 and so on. Uh, so you, you, you draw a line in the sand and you know the condition of your engine before, you know, prior to moving on to uh, your flight testing phase. Yeah, Great explanation there, Des. Thanks. Because, yeah, I'm going to build aircraft. I'm not built to any standard, right? So there's no standard that they need to meet, which is why they can continue uh, running on condition. So we'll move on to the next um, type of aircraft that RLs registers, which is TARP certified. So can a RLs registered TARP certified aircraft operate on condition? If so, why? But firstly, um, can you please describe what a TARP certified aircraft is? 
Well, type certified aircraft in the uh, in the RAOs world is 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 in also in uh, very very similar in line with the uh, the type certification that you'll find in 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 the uh, the CASA environment. So it's an aircraft that has been designed to a set of standards um, and then issued a type certificate stating that the aircraft has been assessed, designed, and manufactured in accordance with these guidelines. So um, you might find that the uh, the Federal Aviation Regulation FAR 23 is a uh, an aeronautical design standard that's used to uh, to design uh, an aircraft. So um, if you build the aircraft and design the aircraft to those standards, then the aircraft is then eligible um, to then go down uh, and be issued uh, by a national airworthiness authority or um, uh, a country that falls under that scheme. They can then issue a, a type certificate. So in the RAOS world, um, for, for example, when, when RAOS went from its, its early beginnings with um, homemade aircraft, I say under 9510, the reason that RAOS is able to exist or developed and grew as, as as rapidly as it did is that under the under the 9555, um, CASA allowed that aircraft that couldn't come into Australia under the CASA regulations um, because CASA doesn't recognise a lot of the the European schedules. RAOS could manage those aircraft. So we have a number of um, aircraft like the DULV, the German. Um, that produce, um, they're, they're a very similar function to, to like what RAOS does to a degree. They issue type certificates for aircraft um, and RAOS was then able to allow and accept those uh, um, and manage those aircraft. And in that type certificate, RAOS, RAOS will, will accept it um, based under the, the rules. Um, and it will state in there that the aircraft must be operated with one or two people, that it has a maximum takeoff weight of anywhere from 450 up to 600. Um, it'll stipulate the engine uh, engine type, um, and then it'll refer it to a manufacturer that had produced the engine. So in this case, maybe a Rotax, and that, that engine may be a 91, uh, 912A or uh, S, which are the certified variants, the 80 horsepower variants. Um, so then that is then a, uh, a requirement that the system of maintenance has to be adhered to um, by that manufacturer. Uh, well, the manufacturer has adhered to the requirements, utilise that, and then the operator of the aircraft and the maintainer then must maintain it in accordance with um, the system of maintenance for that aircraft. So with Rotax engine, you wouldn't use a Jabiru system of maintenance. You have to use the, the Rotax system of maintenance. And that's when we get into the, the TBO. Um, and that's when they, as Jared has already said, they stipulate um, it's um, X hours or X years. Um, and there's a little bit of a loophole around uh, that process. And that is to whether you can run on condition in a type certified aircraft. Correct. Um, yeah. And we do, and, and recently myself and Jared have been getting, you know, a substantial number uh, of, of inquiries around this. Um, so in, in with a type certified aircraft, um, the manufacturer says you have to use um, X amount of, um, you know, you have to use the system of maintenance. So when you get to 2,000 hours, the Rotax manufacturer will give you a 5% uh, or six-month overrun, whichever comes first, okay? And then that basically is, is where the limit stops. Now, in discussion with the Australian agent here, we talked about on condition. So we all know um, that um, a lot of Rotax engines uh, are capable of running for many, many, many more. But, you know, as a, as, you know, from a, uh, a, a financial gain, the manufacturer has stipulated at 2,000 hours um, or whatever years, the aircraft must go back to them and be overhauled. Now, when we looked into um, those mandatory requirements with type certified and with the 5% the or six-month overrun, whichever comes first, in the manual... There is nothing that precludes a member with a type certified aircraft. So remember, this isn't applicable to a 19 amateur built. This is applicable to a type certified aircraft. So you'll see a 24 registration, a 25 registration, a 55 registration um, aircraft that is eligible to run past that because the manufacturer does not specifically terminate at that six months or 5%. So RAOS is... Um, uh, process and working, you know, myself and Jared uh, looked at it and in a review with uh, with the regulator is that whilst we don't condone running past what the manufacturer stipulates, 
we have put pro protocols in place that will allow people due to certain circumstances to run a little bit past that if needed um, because we know that the, the product is is reliable and safe and, and, and the rest of it. So Jared will probably uh, like to um, get into, into what we can do there moving forward with the type certified aircraft. We'll probably just um, let's move there to the last sport side of things now. Because we okay. covered, yeah, we've covered amateur built and type certified where we can run on condition. But now we'll, we'll look at the third um, stream of aircraft that we register. So the last sport aircraft, um, are they able to run on condition? And if so, why or why not? Okay, with a light sport aircraft uh, category, that was a process that was brought in um, by the Americans uh, to ease in the uh, the oversight um, and the regulatory uh, rigmarole that was associated with type certification. So uh, for those that don't know, an LSA allows a manufacturer, uh, you know, a, a small company to build, design, um, test, uh, and then maintain continual airworthiness for that aeroplane and sign for that under a under a realm of uh, documents called the ASTM. So it's the American Society of Testing and Manufacturing. Um, and there's a number of those, I'll just call up what they are here. There's a number of those. There's design and performance, required equipment, quality assurance, production acceptance tests, aircraft operating instructions, continued airworthiness, uh, inspection procedures, um, wing, wing interface, which isn't applicable to uh, three-axis aircraft, uh, engine and propeller. And in that, those guidelines, they have uh, established what a manufacturer must do uh, for uh, a, a, an aircraft uh, to be built. So when we get back to the TBO question, is that the Rotax system of maintenance is what is referred to um, uh, in most of the, the light sport aircraft. There are other engine variants, and, and you would need to consult with... Uh, with the uh, with the engine manufacturer, I know Jabiru um, uh, uh, um, do not allow engines on condition, and there's 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 a statement to that in their manual. But with the Rotax, um, as we said before, with the type certified, there is a loophole because it says that once you get to your your your, your six months or your five percent, there's nothing saying you can't. When it comes to the ASTM standard, the ASTM standard is is the process, it's the crux of the 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 basis of what the the LSA was built on. And in the ASTM standard, it says you must obey the uh, the manufacturer's requirement, and in this case, it's Rotax. Um, and it says that if you get to you know your, your your TBO, there is no provisions to go beyond that. And then they list in the ASTM the requirements of what has to happen for the continued airworthiness of that aircraft. And that's where the owner's responsibility goes back onto the the manufacturer of the light sport. That turns around and says that if the aircraft goes outside that 2,000 hours, that the liability for that then goes back into um, the manufacturer uh, because the aircraft then becomes non-compliant. So it's it, it's 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 somewhat of a minefield where it's discretionary with the way that you interpret what it says for type certified um, in the LSA components. You uh, are very, very limited, and it states very, very uh, um, in black and white in there why you can't go past that because of the on the ongoing um, uh, airworthiness requirements. Um, you can see there that's being high, you know, about what should happen to an aircraft under Section five point four point six. Um, but in saying that, if you own a light sport aircraft and then you decide that you um, want to run on condition, you're only using the aircraft for private use, it's not being used in it for flight training, it is permissible to contact a CASA authorised person um, to reissue you an experimental LSA C of A, which means then that you are operating the aircraft against the best guidance of the manufacturer, you're removing the liability and the ongoing responsibility of the, of the aircraft operating on condition, and you take that on yourself. So it is permissible to run an LSA uh, on condition with a Rotax engine, but it must be, it must be then transferred over to an experimental category, uh, which then allows you to, you know, to effectively um, um, ignore uh, the standard requirements and you take the 
onerous responsibility and the legal liability off the aircraft manufacturer and then you yourself do that and hence the reason why you can't use it for flight training the only the only the only operation you can use an experimental light sport for is for private operations and as it says there, it's, uh, you know, people can read that should an you know, owner-operator not comply with uh, any mandatory service requirements, the LSA shall be considered non-compliant. And that's the reason why there is the ability to take an LSA into ELSA if you want to go down that non-compliant part. Thanks, Beth. So we've covered what on condition is, okay, um, which RLs registered aircraft are applicable to run on condition. So let's have a look now where an aircraft that is applicable to run on condition um, has reached TBO and now they're going to run on condition. What are the requirements to then run on condition? So RA is in the technical manual, so we'll get um is Cody able to bring up those requirements, Jared, or have you got that on a on a just on a on an email? Well, we have um, four of them. It's, it's probably it's difficult to remember all the tech forms that we have, but it's a tech form zero two three. It's the piston engine condition report, which uh, needs to be completed every hundred hours mm -hmm. uh, whilst on condition, which um, you know is looking at static RPM and is carrying down carrying out a cylinder leak check. And uh, also recording more oil uplifts, um, and which is which is a standard process that you should be utilising during during the life of a uh, life of your your engine servicing. So you can't get to the end of your uh, your the life of the engine um, that you know for whatever reason, and then say, hey, I'm going to start doing these monitoring. It's a it's a process that has to be it has to be done for the life of the engine because what that is uh, effectively doing is it's showing that the engine has been maintained and it's compliant. So if your your compressions um, in a Rotax usually are all very, very high, they're usually 76 to 80 on 80, you know, seven, between 76 to, to 80 on 80 in the compressions. But then if you are running an engine on condition for one of these requirements, so a 19, an ELSA or a type certified aircraft, and then all of a sudden you start seeing 75, 74, 73s over a period of your servicing, you can start to identify that, okay, there is some, some wear starting to occur with this engine, and then there's guidelines around operating, um, a, you know, a percentage rate on what the, the differential pressure testing of a, of a cylinder um, is good at and, and where it stops producing power, where you've got excessive wear in piston rings or valves. Um, so it's a, that's the reason for that requirement. So if you're not doing that, um, it's, a, it's a requirement uh, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the maintenance of your engine, um, to do that, and then if you get to the end of your life and you have been doing the uh, the engine uh, piston engine condition report, then you are able to apply in certain circumstances to run that engine past that TBO because you can validate that hey yes it's been a good engine I've been doing regular oil changes I've been changing I've been maintaining the engine in accordance with the manufacturer's specs um, I need to I need to run the engine for an extra you know, an extra six months or year or so because of, uh, uh, you know, say in this case, um, some people may have lost their position due to COVID. So they might be, you know, facing financial hardship. We might have some CFIs or, you know, schools uh, that have been doing this um, that need to run the engine, you know, another, you know, six or 12 months because they uh, just simply can't afford a brand new engine. And in a type certified aircraft, they're allowed to, you know, where the process was brought in, um, not to be cut blanche across all type certified aircraft, but it was to be used with a with a with a degree of discretion um, to uh, to allow you know primarily our flight school operations to run a little bit past that um, due to you know um, some dry times or financial hardships. So we need to we need to re, you know need to reiterate that you know p engines on condition in Emmett are built is a totally separate and different kettle of fish to an engine running on condition that's then being used in one of our flight training facilities. Yeah, so running on condition is a reward for good maintenance. Exactly. That you covered there because one of the other requirements to go on condition is the fact that you have carried out maintenance on that engine in accordance with the manufacturer's requirements from day dot. Yeah. And the key requirements. But again, for members, for members out there, 
um, you know, myself and Jared uh, make ourselves available. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question. Um, again, we don't, we're, we're not in the habit of, you know, grounding aircraft or removing privileges unless our hand is absolutely forced. So don't, don't ever think that you can't send an email or, or ask a question. We do find that we do get a lot of um, keyboard warriors and a lot of, you know, um, experts around airfields that will tell members um, one thing, which is contradictory to what we may have said tonight. But we can validate that with our rules, with our regulations, um, and, and we will follow that up with an email or with a specific reference to you as the member. Um, so if you do have someone who is somewhat believing that they, they may be right and we may be wrong, um, you can take it from us that, you know, we will substantiate that with the appropriate um, uh, documentation, the appropriate process. Um, and this is this has been discussed at length. Um, we have a very, very close working relationship with uh, with the sport team at CASA and, and they have an aeronautical engineer in there um, who uh, has a very, very good understanding of what is there and what we can and can't do. So um, don't ever, you know... Um, Unless someone can validate it with a rule or a regulation, it's nothing more than hearsay. And that's what I tell our membership. So we can validate that. Um, and if there's something that we haven't covered and you want a little bit more clarity, by all means, you know, send myself or Jared an email or pick the phone up and give us a bell. And uh, we're happy to, you know, step this through you, uh, step this with everyone um, on a one by one basis if need be. Yeah, totally agree. So we've got um, two more questions we'll cover on this topic. We, um, move on. It's, uh, it's also quite common, Daz, is that uh, can I operate my Rotax engine 5% over TBO? Of course you can. Uh, and it states that in the uh, the maintenance section of the uh, uh, the Rotax manual, so anyone that uh, is operating a, uh, a, uh, a Rotax power plant, whether it's a two-stroke right the way through to the, uh, the 915 ISs that are now on the market, um, it does state that, and uh, I'm looking at the uh, the uh, the Rotax manual here for the maintenance manual uh, for line maintenance, uh, the 912 series, which is January 01 of 2020, um, and it says in Section 3, um, authorised exceeding extension of or exceeding the TBA by 5% or six months is allowed, whichever comes first. So mm -hmm. it's there in black and white in the Rotax manual. So then I could do that with uh, light sport aircraft as well. According to the manual, absolutely you can. Okay. So it, you can't run past that like we discussed before with the type certified, but in a uh, in an LSA, it is permissible to run your 5% or your six months, whichever comes first, um, on your LSA aircraft. Okay. So yeah, so, yeah what Cody's brought up is a... Uh, Service Bulletin, um, which is talking about the extension to TBO times on Rotax engines. Yep. Uh, which is outside of the manual because sometimes in the, when the manual was brought out, it had the um, TBO time. Sorry, my screen looks kind of actually read that at this point in time. But so it um, shows you the 912A and the 912F, they're your certified um, variants. Um, so it talks about um, a lot of the earlier model ones. Remember, these are 80 horsepower, um, and these are uh, under a, uh, a different certification schedule. Um, so their TBOs are, were a lot less. Um, there's not many of these engines left anymore that are out there being operated. Um, you know, the uh, on a sideline, um, RAOS has this process called MARIP where we've been able to uh, introduce this modification and repair approval process, uh, especially for our type certified variants. Where we've been able to modify a lot of the earlier aircraft now and remove the 912As and upgrade those aircraft with the 912 ULSs or IS engines, which then provides a, a, a longer TBO uh, and a far better supported base for those, uh, those engines. Um, the increase in horsepower by 20, 20 horsepower is, is so negligible in the scheme of things. The aircraft might get to, might get to its cruise speed a little bit quicker, um, but it has no real effect on the, the weight and balance or the performance of the aircraft. Um, so, but it is from a financial perspective, if you were to buy a 912A in comparison to buying a 912 ULS, uh, there is a substantial financial difference with the type certified being type certified costing you more. So that may be something that myself and Jared will discuss at a later date, but there are other avenues out there that we can, we can assist the membership with. 
Okay. So we've got um, just one last question we'll cover on the topic. I'll just recap what we've looked at now um, was what on condition is, what aircraft streams is applicable to in regards mm -hmm. to build CARP certified and LSA, what is required to run on condition, um, can they operate 5% over, and so lastly we'll cover, because what we basically talked about previously was about private operations, and we'll just focus with this next question to do with flying school operations. So in a flying school they can really obviously only operate manufactured aircraft, on a TARP certified or LSA. So we covered that an LSA aircraft engine cannot run on condition, but for a TARP certified aircraft operating in a flying school, can that run on condition? The answer is yes. Um, because the guidelines around, because, and I said, we're exploiting a loophole in the system. Um, I'll be open and honest about this. When I discussed this with the Australian Rotax agent, they were quite concerned that it was a process that we were we were considering or, or looking at. But when I explained the uh, what the idea behind on condition was, and I touched on it before about schools and and members that may have faced hardship, whilst they they uh, they weren't supportive of it, they understood the logic behind it. And remember, at the moment, that at the moment, Rotax say, as we've said, five percent or six months, it can go over, over. But there's nothing saying past that six months or five percent. Okay, so if you get to six percent, seven percent, eight percent, does the engine change? Well, obviously not. But until such time um, that Rotax put a thing in there and say it is mandated at that five percent or six months, you know, two thousand, you know, one hundred, or you know, whatever it may be. The, the engine is able to in the type certified because it's not governed like the ASTM where the ASTM says at 2,100 hours, you must stop, okay? The, uh, the, uh, the, the loophole is an interpretive understanding of when you get to that 5% or that six months, is there something that says that you must stop at that? And, and as I said, it's an exploitation of the wording of the manufacturer's system of maintenance which is similarly to what's been done in the in the general aviation uh, world with the way that Lycomian like, continental um, processes are, uh, are, are, uh, are understood and how people proceed to, to, to operate their engines past those hours. Um, so, again, with the type certified aircraft, you must make sure that the aircraft has had the piston engine condition report and then you can validate the you know, safe operation of that aircraft, remembering that you are using that aircraft for higher award or gain um, in a flight training facility. So we wouldn't suggest that anyone went past sort of, you know, maybe three to six months at, a, at an absolute. But again, it depends on how often the aircraft's flown, the, re you know, the, the maintenance cycles, the condition of the engine, um, you know, if you're maintaining that aircraft. And again, it may be, you, you, you may be hamstrung. You may have had a, a couple of bad years. You might have an engine that's reached TBA due to calendar time, but you might only have 400 hours on it. So you're running past it, you would allow, as long as you maintain the schedule, so you replaced your rubber, you did your, your rubber replacement every five years and you did your whatever else, you, you're only time X by calendar time. Also, too, you may have a, a school where, you know, you've done, you know, 2,000 hours in 10 years, but you've still got all those extra years to run and you may not be in a position financially. So it's a matter of, you know, um, how we've exploited, and as I use the word exploited, what the manual says. And the manual says 5% or six months, whichever comes first, but then there's not a wording in there that says you must stop. So, again, I'll, I, I, I make sure people understand that this is for type certified RAOs registered aircraft. Um, this doesn't, you know, LSA is a different category and 19 it's not applicable to or 10. Mm -hmm. Just while we're on this topic, we'll just talk about the one caveat there is with um, operating a tough verified aircraft on condition in the flying school, is that if it was, um, you know, so it's a 2,000 hour TBO, the aircraft's been operating in the school since new, it could then go on condition when it gets to 2,000 hours. Sure. The school could not go and purchase an aircraft with 2,200 hours on it, and then operate that aircraft on condition in the school. It would have it would have had to have previously been operating in the school prior to going on condition, which is a requirement in our, our technical manual. Okay, well, 
Yeah, you, you're exactly right. I'm just, um, I'm just taking a quick glance across. We've had a, a, a message um, on on our uh, Facebook stream. I'm sort of catch on my eye. Um, uh, Nick Humphreys has put so an LSA can't even use a five percent or six months uh, allowed the manual. Well, we've stated that that is what you are allowed to do um, because that's what the manual stipulates. But as uh, as we said, you can't go past the five percent. All the six months, whichever comes first, Nick. So uh, hopefully that clears it up for you. But as I said, if there's anything further, um, don't hesitate in uh, sending me an email and uh, or a number and I'll give you a call back. Um, we also need to make sure that members record their landings um, as well when they when they were. Uh, it's a requirement that uh, we have to have in in our reporting schedule. Um, um, you know, the uh, tech manual section 5.1, para 6.4. So when you're out there, make sure you are recording uh, your, uh, your your landings when, you, when you're recording this data um, because it all is a, it's all part of the requirements within the technical manual. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that screen. There's another question there, Daz, from Brad H. Is it true that the use of Avgas reduces the TBO on my 912? My name, says that this was the case in the past, but now gas is different in its makeup so this doesn't apply have you heard of there, there, there are there are there are operational um, differences for engines that are run on avgas and there are operational um, um, differences and maintenance requirements for aircraft that are operated on the uh, on mogas um, and that is that is I'm not going to go into the specifics of that now Brad but it is very it, it, it's it's um, highlighted. Uh, in the, uh, the the road tax manual, and it's what I said before too. Um, it's great that you Lamy said that, but as I will say to anyone, if someone's going to make a statement along those lines, validate it with a rule or a reference. So um, in this case, he has highlighted an area. It is in the system of maintenance, uh, the maintenance processes for um, um, running MoGas versus running AvGas um, in the actual um, in the. Um, um, uh, Rotax system of maintenance. Yeah, yeah Brad always used 98 no gas. Yeah. Oh, good. All right, next question was from Stormy's Rider. You can't do flight training in an on condition, but you can do your BFR on one. So I think we covered that. That, yep. um, yeah, with a type certified aircraft in a flying school, it can, can, flight training can be carried out and um, with an unconditioned engine, unless, with the requirements of the piston engine condition report and the other the other mandatory items as identified in the technical manual, um, Stormy, you can do flight training um, in your aircraft in in that. But in saying that, it's only an aircraft that is operated by that school. So if you have your own type certified aircraft that is is on condition. You can't bring that into the school to do your flight training, but you are able to use that for private use for your BFR. So hopefully that clears you up. Yeah, just yeah. another anonymous question there was about um, BFRs and one. So yes, there is a, you know, amateur built aircraft owners are running their aircraft on condition. They bring it to a school to go see an instructor. Um, they carry out their BFR on that aircraft. Yeah. So I think that, um, concludes all the questions we have there on um, on condition. I can see we have a um, question from Mark Stevens that uh, relates to the barometer. Um, we'll probably get Jill back to have a discussion on that. And if there's any other questions um, that members have, um, please feel free to um, send them on through before we Absolutely. finish. Absolutely. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. That was really cool. Right? I think I'm here to be. We had a question way back, um, about 20 past six. So you guys have been talking pretty happily there, and it's a really good subject to chat about. But David Howson asked about any advancement on the MTO discussion. Um, we have covered this a few times, um, David, but happy to cover it again. Still uh, very much working with CASA on the uh, increase, the proposed increase to 760 kilos. There's a couple of little details we're, uh, we're ironing out. Um, and the intention is to create a new category of pilot operating um, certificate called the Group G. 
Uh, so we're going to leave Group A, B and D alone. So in other words, if you've got a 600 kilo aircraft right now, um, nothing changes. Nothing will change in the requirements or expectations of what we uh, do for flight training, flight ops or maintenance. But for something in Group G, which is 601 to 760 kilos, uh, we'll create a new category of, of pilot certificate and there'll be different maintenance requirements depending on the category of aircraft. But we can't give you detail on that yet because we haven't finished ironing all those details out with CASA. So as soon as we know something, you guys will absolutely know something. Um, so uh, any other questions? Yeah, oh, there we go. E24, handing back over to Daz and Jared. Any further advancement on an E24, um, Pete? I, I, I need a, probably need a little bit more info on the advancement of an E24. Uh, um, you know, we yeah, experiment. As what um, you know, between amateur built experimental, um, there's a misunderstanding between what can go experimental. I so agree. Yeah. Only light sport aircraft can go experimental. Is what E24 refers to. So I think, it's, again, it's one of those common questions to do with uh, can a thruster become a 19, um, you know, a manufactured thruster or manufactured drifter, um, yeah, move to. You may, you, may, you, may want to, you may want to mention what we're working on behind the scenes, Jared, with the, with the M category. Oh, well, a topic. That's another, that's an hour on its own. We'll <laughs> leave that apartment for another time. Okay, I'm just dangling the carrot. So... Yeah, just just um yeah, just confirm um how uh, an E twenty four comes about. Well, an E twenty four is is uh, as I mentioned before with the with the experimental, you have light sport and then you have experimental light sport. So whilst um, the manufacturer of a light sport aircraft, so I'll use uh, an aircraft that I'm familiar with, which which, which is a Foxbat. Um, uh, it, the Foxbat manufacturer provides a number of modifications and changes. Now, um, some people, uh, some of our members have uh, ideas and, and, and processes that they want to implement. So with an, E20, with a, with an LSA, you're, um, Yuri, the designer of the Foxbat, is responsible for the continued airworthiness of that aircraft. It leaves his factory. It's met these standards in accordance with the ASTM. It comes out here to Australia. It becomes registered. Then, uh, then member X decides, well, hey, I want to put a uh, three-axis autopilot um, and I want to put this particular propeller and I want to put these big Tundra tyres in it. Um, if the URI and at Foxbat decides, no, I'm not happy to support that, the member has the ability under the LSA category to go experimental, apply to a CASA delegate, allow that person to um, um, issue an experimental. So basically it's an e either we have the, the two categories now for LSA. It's either E20, any, E24 or E23 um, um, because of the number changing. It has to have the letter E placed in front of the, the, the prefix of the two. So E24 or E23. Uh, the aircraft has to have a experimental uh, placard, 300 mil long, 50 mil high, uh, on the door that's in clear view of the passenger. And then the warning placard inside changes from this aircraft is built in accordance with the light sport. It's, this aircraft is an experimental light sport and the wording changes. So the person that hops into it needs to be made aware that the aircraft isn't compliant. So it might look like a fox bat, might smell like a fox bat, but it's no longer a fox bat. Um, and then that allows that person to then modify that aircraft um, with a with a with a fair um, degree of um, freedom. It's a, you know where we don't have RAOS doesn't have an experimental category. We do under LSA, so you can take a, a certified uh, LSA in this case and then modify it to to whatever you you, you choose. Um, you know, free of your will. Um, uh, we had a member the other day who who has purchased uh, a trike an LSA trike um, because he wanted to build his own but didn't want to go too far into it. Um, and he's now purchased that aircraft. He's going to go and get an experimental certificate because he's changing the pod and he's putting electric motor in it. So that allows him to go down that path, um, um, which then puts it very similarly in the 19 category. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. See, Joel. Okay, question from Paul. Hi guys, I'm building a fusion pole air camper, which I am intending to register with RL. I'm also an L2 and X ramp engines airframe tech. I've gone to the web page and downloaded the form. Excellent. Good job, Paul. Yes, well done. Right. 
I have a preliminary workshop inspection. I would like to have a progressive inspection just to meet, to keep me honest. How do I go about this? So that's what um, uh, Darren explained earlier about Tech Form 023. So uh, at least uh, if you've got a road taxi engine, okay, let's use that as an example. That's every 200 hours you would need to complete that document before going. Yeah, I think I think, think this one here is a, it's um, it's pre, you know preliminary workshop inspection. How would I like to progress the inspection just to keep me honest? I think this one's a, a little bit off topic. I, Gerald, I, just, I think Paul's just asking for um, you know someone to uh, you know to come around have a look at his workshop. Paul, uh, shoot us an email. Let us know your location, um, and um, we uh, would um, you know find someone in your area if if it's local for myself or Jared. Um, you know, there's 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 always something magical about someone that's built a wooden aeroplane from scratch uh we'll arrange someone to come around and work with you and, and and have a look at that and sniff your sawdust and eat your tim tams and you can make us a coffee so uh that's uh quite a quite an easy thing to do and it's something that myself and jared have spoken at length about you know behind the scenes um it's something our our our, our brothers our brothers and sisters at the SAAA do extremely well through their chapter network where they have a lot of interaction with builders visits Unfortunately, you know, it's something that RA Oz members, they're a lot more secretive. You know, they keep everything sort of hidden. Um, so we openly encourage people to open their hangar doors, um, invite members around to have a look at what they're building, cast a set of eyes over, have these maintenance talks um, because it generates a, a, a really good feel and a really, really good um, uh, questionable uh, base that you can learn a, a substantial amount from. Yeah, like we're getting down to our hour. There's a last question there, Jill, um, from Mark Stevens. Uh, saying, Team, the barometer is interesting, but I've never recorded landings. I don't think there's a requirement to do so. What is the recommended practice here? And Darren did mention before in the tech manual, uh, on renewal, you need to supply hours and landings for your aircraft. However, if um, you don't own an aircraft, which 7,000 of our members don't, um, there's no requirement for them to record landings. Yeah, really good point. Um, and in that instance, I guess all you could do is approximate based on what you might normally fly in a, in a session. So if you're a pilot that uh, hires an aircraft, grabs it, takes off, disappears for an hour and comes back, well, you can generally add one landing uh, to each hour you fly. Um, if you're a pilot that might be practicing circuits, you know, on sessions, then generally in an hour you could do between six and eight landings. So you can generally approximate the number of landings per hour, depending on what you've flown. Um, the other document that we have in the tech world, is, as I remember, is the uh, HAM, the Hours and Maintenance Record, which is an awesome document that I use to record my landings uh, for my aircraft. So that's maybe something that might be able to be used if you own the aircraft. Um, I guess if you want to get really pedantic, you could actually ask the uh, school uh, how many landings you recorded, because that's actually something that they're obliged to do, as Baz said, with that uh, reference from the um, uh, the tech manual, section 5.1, I think it was. Um, so it's a good question. We've got one more question there, which is probably, again, going to be a tech question from Michael. Uh, yeah. Michael J. Russell, can a gazelle be upgraded to 100 horsepower Rotex? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, Michael, we have done this already, so... Uh, if you want to uh, pick this, uh, send me send me your, 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 your mobile number, shoot us a, an email at, uh, at um, tech at raoz.com.au um, and your mobile number, I'll give you a bell and have a talk to you on, on how this can be achieved um, uh, via our merit process, which is the modification and repair approval process. So, uh, yeah, man, there's a few other modifications out there that I can talk to you about that, you know, you may be interested in as well. Not having a... Uh, um uh, what's the prop on the on the gazelles? Uh, what they are? Yeah, well, it's uh, body approved now. Yeah, yeah body approved. Merit yes. process. So uh, that's an excellent modification to your gazelle through the merit process. G five Garmin's fitted as well, so um, we you, we can bring a lot of the uh, um, the technology, the new technology, into the old legacy heritage, uh, which is the foundation of where our organisation come from. Um, and, and they're still operating, you know, 30 years later. So uh, we can, uh, you know, we can pimp your ride. Don't you worry about that and do it legally. Yeah, we'll probably spend a whole um, session talking about modification repair approval um, on a, another forum. 
There's another question from Mark with Group G. Do you think it will parallel the SAAA rules? Can I answer that one, for Jill? Um, I would. I'm not quite sure what SAAA rules Mark's referring to. Um, uh, well, SAAA well, operates the same rules as the rest of us um, in terms of operations. I think I think maybe Mark, knowing Mark, I think maybe he might be uh, asking that if we do get the the uh, the Group G in the increased weight, um, will you be able to bring your S, your RA your uh, your VH registered aircraft across to RAOs? And I think we've discussed this before about if you are the builder um, uh, of that fifty one percent, the major portion of an aircraft on the VH register, um, and RAOs is successful with the Group G with the the uh, the increase to seven hundred. Uh, no, Mark's saying building an inspection. Um, okay, Mark. Well, we uh, we are we are working with um, um, with the wonderful Brian Ham at the uh, the SAAA and 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 the great Norm Edmonds uh, on aligning ourselves with a lot of the processes because it seems silly to uh, to have um, you know certain uh, certain differences uh, when we are one and the same. We just uh, you know we're a self administering organisation. Why? SAAA operates under the, the, the you know, the, the VH CASA banner. So, uh, again, mate, if you've got any questions, just flick me an email. You've got my number. Give me a bell, and I'm, I'm happy to take this offline and, and work with you on that. I just to tidy up the last question, the last one would be Peter Marsh. Would the E24 be applicable to type certified aircraft? Uh, no. So the E experimental... Um, Two four, it's only applicable to large sport aircraft with the two four prefix. So, uh, as we mentioned before, at the moment, RAOS has the merit process that will allow you to modify a twenty four that's type certified, but we don't have a process yet that's been approved that will allow you to take a type certified model and turn it into a into a variant of a say a nineteen. But that's uh, that's something that's in the pipe works, and I'm sure that's something Jared will inform everyone at a later stage. Pop dangling carrots, guys. You're a mean person. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff going on behind the scenes, you know, that the members will uh, will benefit from greatly uh, in the tech world. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's taken a long time to, to get to where we are now, especially with MARIP, and, and now that we've earned that trust with the regulator, um, you know, it's, it's now opening up a lot of doors that our members will get uh, a very very big uh, benefit from uh, in the in the future. So uh, we're pretty much at our hour. I mean, we could keep talking all night, but um, we probably need to you know let people break off. But uh, one of the things we we're going to talk about uh, today as well, which we can defer to another time, is um, I wanted to talk some information, uh, provide some information to CFIs and instructors, particularly about converting pilots because a, a large part of, of, well, not a large part, but a significant part of what RALs is about includes converting pilots, not just from the CASA world, but from our uh, brothers and sisters over there at, uh, at SAFA, or what used to be known as HGFA, from the GFA, um, and from ASRA. And we will accept hours, et cetera, from those organisations. A lot of our military pilots come across and enjoy flying our aircraft. So we will be doing another session soon um, just talking about converting because there's a whole, just like on condition, there's a whole world of information we can give you. Um, but I think we're probably, unless there's any other final questions, I think we're probably done. I will, I will just sort of uh, just quickly um, state for the members out there, under the under the MARIP um, process, the MARIP process is, um, um, it is done in, in conjunction with some of Australia's premier uh, aeronautical engineers, and uh, I have to I have to say uh, a big shout out to someone like um, to Bill Whitney. Uh, Bill is uh, is uh, uh, um, you know a character and been you know uh, uh, you know an integral part in a lot of designs of aircraft in Australia, and and helps uh, myself and Jared um, with the merit process. So if you are considering a merit process. Um, you need to. Oh, there you go. There's there's something there from from Denise. Hi, Denise. Say good day to Bill. Um, yeah. Um, if you do have an idea like that, the process does require an aeronautical engineer, subpart 21M, a uh, light bill to be involved. Um, we also use a number of uh, aeronautical engineers. So if you do have a, an idea uh, for a MARIP for one of these type certified aircraft, um, you can save yourself a, a lot of time and heartache uh, by by nutting it out with those guys first. Thanks, Des. 
All right. Well, I think uh, we've done some really good discussions there. Thanks, uh, everyone, for your time. There's been some uh, good guys lurking around there, Dan Compton from Wings Out West and a few others of our stalwarts that support us so well. Um, so thanks, everyone, for your time. There's a thanks from Warren. Appreciate uh, you being here, Warren. I hope you got some benefit out of it. We've had fun, as we always do. Um, and uh, and David, yep, happy to have helped with that MTO question. There, uh, There's no such thing as a silly question when we uh, do these things. And Brad, I'm a bit worried about that, um, that icon. Brad looks like he's kind of rare with <laughs> So uh, thanks, everyone, for your time. Uh, we'll have another one of these. Keep an eye out on your um, e-news and your members app and the member portal. We'll give you some more info. Thanks, Daz and Jared, and uh, we'll see you next time. Fly safe. See you, guys. Thanks.